Indian summer. Hello and welcome to an Indian summer in conversation with Jamel Anderson. Uh, we're going to link this to our sofa cinema. Bend it like Beckham. We're going to explore some of the diversity in sports, maybe some of the challenges and issues uh, that Jamel may have faced through his career. And we're also going to look at his basketball career as a whole. If you're a basketball fan, you'll know all about him. A career spanning over 10 years, seven trophies with the Leicester Riders. He's played in Australia and Spain as well. If you're not a basketball fan, you probably know him as the guy who went viral proposing on the court at the Commonwealth Games to his fiance. Jamel, great to have you with us. Um, first of all, I'm assuming your wedding plans have been disrupted by this whole lockdown thing. Yeah, postponed um, to a further notice. <laughs> nightmare, nightmare. Um, I want to have a look at how you got into basketball. So let's go right back to the beginning, if you like. You grew up in, in Nottingham, just turned yeah. 30, so it would have been the 1990s. Um, Nottingham had a bit of a reputation at that time. It was uh, it used to get a little beating in the in the press. What was your recollection of childhood in Nottingham? Um, my childhood in Nottingham was really fun, actually. Um, I was, in my opinion, of the last generation of kids that played outside. <laughs> um, so, you know, running around playing football and basketball too, actually, um, on the local courts and the local park. So I had a great childhood and I really appreciate the time that I had in Nottingham as a teenager. And how was it that you came to basketball? Where did it start out? Obviously Nottingham has a, a famous women's basketball team. So yeah. how did you get into the sport in the first place? Um, to be honest, my first uh, introduction to basketball was Space Jam. So, um, you know, watching Space Jam as a, as a kid, I loved the sport. I loved, obviously, the film, uh, Looney Tunes, all of that involved. Um, but that was my first introduction. Um, I didn't have it on TV. If it was on TV, I never saw it. Um, so, yeah, I fell in love with the game at a very young age. But it wasn't until secondary school that it was actually introduced to me as an option, as something that I can do. Um, so, yeah, so was, year eight was the first time I actually played any type of organized basketball. So was that through the school or did you join a local club at that point? Yeah, so I went to a school called Genogli City Academy in Nottingham. Um, and the teacher was Mr. Tate. He was an American uh, physical education teacher. And I can't remember why, but he decided that he wanted to start a basketball after school club and a team as well. Um, I went to the first training session and I've never looked back, never looked back since. And what was the journey... From there, did, did you go, was it all the way through school or did you have to do outside as well? What else? Yeah, so the school was probably a year of basketball um, where I didn't do any other team um, uh, basketball. So played for our school for a year after school club, before school. He had his coming in at like 7 a.m. before school. Um, you know, I wasn't even able to dribble with my left hand at that point, but we were getting in before school and training. So I definitely was very committed from the from the get-go um, and it was it was really nice to get sunk into a new sport because all I had done before that was athletics football and a, a little bit of rugby so it was a completely new experience for me I understood that it was an Americanized or American born sport so to speak so I knew it was something that I hadn't been involved in before and yeah I just loved it we trained pretty much every day like I said before and sometimes after school as well um, and then a year later, I was picked up to play for a club called the Nottingham Youth Basketball Club with the coach called Curtis Xavier. Curtis Xavier, a legendary name in the, in the British game. I remember him playing in the 80s, uh, a great player. A lot of people who came through that talk about him as a real positive influence. Was, was he one of them on you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of my um, pivotal memory I have with Curtis as a coach he had it the whole, pretty much the whole academy in a room once. He was doing a big talk on professionalism and, you know, how to conduct yourself as an athlete. And he went around the room and he asked each individual, um, what am I to you? You know, I know I'm your coach, but what do you see me at? And when he came to me, I actually said, funnily enough, like, I think you're like a father fig figure to me because he not only coached us, but he coaches on life. He coaches on you know, how to conduct yourself in the community. 
Um, so yeah, I really, really attach myself to him as a coach, but also as a, as a leader. And at that point in life, I'm assuming you didn't, you talked earlier about not really seeing it on, on TV or anything. Uh, at, at what point did you become conscious of basketball outside of, outside of your little world in Nottingham? Um, so the first BBL game that I was ever taken to, I think I was, I think I was almost maybe 18. The first time I actually saw a professional basketball game, I was 18. I'd been playing three years by that point. Um, obviously the internet was starting to, you know, catch on a little bit so you could see videos here and there. But to be honest with you, I was too uh, focused on my own basketball to care about everything else. You know, a lot of people told me when I was younger, you know, you need to watch this and you need to study and you need to understand the world of basketball. But I was just in love with the game. So I was more interested in about what I was doing rather than the rest of the world. Um, but yeah, that Curtis Xavier, he took us to Europe. He took us to Belgium a couple of times. So I started to pick up the understanding that basketball is huge and it's, and it's global. Mm. And were there any barriers or challenges that you faced at, at, at that time coming up and playing basketball? Um, I don't, I wouldn't say there was barriers, but I'd say there was a lot of tests along the way. Um, where I played, where I lived was a state called Clifton and where I trained was, I don't know how many miles necessarily, but it was two bus rides and it was, mm. 40 minutes each ride, each bus ride. So, you know, at a young age, 15, 16, um, I was definitely traveling a long way to play basketball because there wasn't any of that near where I lived. Um, but I also went to school almost an hour away from where I lived. So I was already used to that kind of traveling alone, using um, the Nottingham transport services to get around. So I wouldn't say it was a barrier for me personally, but I can imagine for a lot of people that could be an issue having to travel to play basketball. Um, mm. And then, like I said, there were a few tests along the way. Fortunately, we had good leaders. We had uh, David Watts, I know, known as Tintin. Um, he was one of my coaches. Um, having people like that around was, was pivotal in stopping us from making a lot of mistakes. You know, a lot of the basketball that we played was in areas you know, that weren't the greatest places for, you know, kids like myself to be hanging around. Um, so, yeah, you know, there were some racial issues as well. Um, we played against certain teams that, you know, they would bore you a name in the game or they would say something in the change rooms after the game. But, again, we had so many good leaders and role models around us, which I'm just very fortunate for, that we didn't slip into any of that nonsense. And I, I mean, how did you deal with that? Was it just sort of water off the duck's back and just let it go? Or what was it? Um, I think initially you want to react. Um, mm. you, you want to, you know, fight, so to speak. Um, but the coaches were just always on top of us. The, the older players kind of saw us as like their, their younger guys, their younger brothers. So it was just kind of, it was ironed out. You know, in practice, it wasn't allowed. You couldn't have arguments and fights and stuff like that. So I guess the respect for the club and the respect for the coaches, um, you, you chose to act correctly most of the time. That's what happened. Well, at what point did you think, actually, I'm, I'm quite good at this. this. This might be an option for me going forward. I still haven't reached that, <laughs> that point yet. <laughs> when does that come? <laughs> um, no, I think um, it wasn't me. It was it was being told that um, you know you've got a, a really good opportunity here. Um, I, there was actually I tell it like there was a moment when I came home once and I told my mom like, listen, I played really well today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to become like a really good player in this in this club, and I think I've got a good chance of making it pro. But other than that, I'd, I'd say about 16, 17. It was probably around the age where I started to realize that if I keep working hard, I might have a chance to make it pro. And I think it was about uh, that age, maybe, maybe a year or two after that, I'm not sure, that you first played with men, if you like, in the national, national leagues. 
What, what was that experience like as a young player? Gary, um, I, I, my, my whole career has, has been big leaps, big jumps um, that at the time I didn't feel prepared for. Um, but you realize that there's not really any way to prepare yourself other than just get thrown in the deep end. Um, thankfully, the club that we played at, the harder you worked, um, the more opportunities came your way. Um, so, yeah, around 16 was probably the first time I got to play on the men's team, in the men's league. Um, yeah, it was challenging, but like I said, we had so many good leaders and role models around us that you kind of convinced yourself that this was what was meant to be. Mm. It, it sounds like if they told you that you could do it, you, you just believed that you could do it. It took the doubts away from you, maybe. Yeah, 100%. Everyone in that generation on those teams that I played for, we really took uh, Curtis's word for everything. It was, it was gospel to us. So if he told you you were good enough, you felt like you were good enough. And that was, that was, that's how it went back then. And, uh, of course, you made it into the Great Britain under-20s team, which uh, must have been a tremendous honour for you at the time. That's, that's one of those leaps that I was talking about. It's just like... Um, Another thing that I, I really didn't know much about. I didn't know much about the international setup. Um, we were just kind of in a little bubble in 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 Nottingham. X, uh, I call him X. Curtis Xavier didn't let us, yeah. you know, go and play in tournaments and go here, there, and everywhere. He kept us here in a bubble all year round. You know, we were just training, training, training. And this opportunity came around to go to the under twenties Great Britain um, tryout. And to be honest with you, I kind of remember him not really being involved in the whole thing. It was more someone else that had actually got in touch, I think. Um, and he just, you know, he didn't really believe in the whole England basketball and all of that because I don't think he respected how they treated players and the professionalism that was going on within those setups. So this was the first time that we ever got a chance to, you know, dip our toes in the international stuff. And to make it into the team on that first try was, man, words can't describe how happy I was. And again, was that another moment where you suddenly thought, there is something in this, there, there is a possibility to become a professional out of this? <laughs> I was just waiting for them to, to realize they'd made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> me? You want me on the team? Um, nah, it was, it was, yeah, it was definitely a, Big confidence boost. Um, I remember coming back after Great Britain, um, the whole you know journey of that first year of playing for them, and coming back and feeling like the game was so much slower. I felt like everybody was moving in slow motion. And it's just because once you play at what you perceive to be such a high level, and you come back to a level that you think is below it, your confidence is through the roof. Um, and, it, and it showed in how I played. I was so much more aggressive. Um, when I say aggressive, I mean trying to score and dunking the ball and stuff like that. Um, it really it heightened my ability just because of my self belief. And then um, you came into the to the BBL with with Essex, and there was a real GB under twenties feel to that team. What what do you remember that that first taste of the top division in, in British basketball? Yeah. Um, I remember the first game and feeling like the court was double the size that it should be. I felt so small. Um, the speed was way past what I was used to. Um, the strength, the ability, everything was just... I wasn't used to that level of basketball. So, again, it was one of those massive jumps where I was like, okay, I've still got a long way to go. But it just motivated me. And I enjoyed the fact that I was, you know a small fish in a huge pond. Um, and yeah, I worked hard. I worked hard to try and uh, catch up with the level that I was obviously playing at. Um, within two years, I felt like I, you know, got myself to a point where I was respected enough that I could probably play on most of the teams in the league. Not necessarily start, but I could, I could get, a, get a contract. I think the first time I saw you play, um, it was a, a TV game. I was doing the commentary 
And I forget who you were playing now. It might have been Milton Keynes or somebody like that. Yeah, and I just remember, right. I remember seeing you and thinking, wow, here is a kid who's just got unbelievable energy and a real desire to play defense as well as, uh, as attack. And I thought at the time, perhaps it was something of the bravado of youth, but actually you've never really lost that, that desire uh, to play at both ends of the floor. Yeah, it's definitely, I haven't slowed down in that regard yet, um, thankfully. Um, I think that's just kind of how I, I enjoy it. I've, I've always said I enjoy hard work. So that energy that you see, I'm not really trying to do that. That's just what I want to do. That's just naturally how I want to play the game. And I think um, one thing that people might not notice about you is if you wander into the Morningside Arena on any given day, you might be in there getting shots up. You're the, you're the guy who's always putting the extra work in. I remember sat there uh, one Sunday and Rob had texted me, your coach, Rob Padanostro. And I said, oh, two of the guys are in training. And he went, Jamel and who? Because he knew you would be one of the two guys in there uh, working hard. I mean, I suppose, is that work ethic something that you've always had? Does it translate into the rest of your life? Was it something taught? Is that something that Curtis put into you? Where, where did that come from? Um, I think it was already in me from watching my parents. So my, my mom was a single mom, you know, having two, three jobs at a time. Whether I like it or not, I understood the importance of hard work just from living with her, um, growing up around my mom. So I think it was already in me. And I think once I got to X, he kind of just channeled that energy into basketball. And he made me understand that there really isn't a ceiling as long as you work hard. So I realized, okay, the more I work hard, the better I'm going to get. And I've always just carried that with me. So you, uh, you're in the BBL at that point and the opportunity to come to uh, Leicester and also play with the Loughborough University team as well. How important do you think that is for, for kids coming up to have that option to be exposed to top level basketball, but also go through the education system at, at somewhere like Loughborough and other teams have links to their own universities as well? Education to me is pivotal um, in terms of whatever it is you're trying to do in life. I think if you can achieve a degree at least um, and you can do it whilst playing sport, then, you know, it's something that no one can take away from you. Uh, I, I now have a sports management and finance degree from Loughborough University. Um, if you had told me that, you know, seven, eight years ago, I'd have been like, how, how am I going to get into a situation where I can get a degree from Loughborough but also play professional basketball. Um, I know that I'm very fortunate for that situation. Um, I feel so appreciative of all the staff at Loughborough University that helped me um, to achieve that degree whilst juggling playing professional basketball. But the more I've noticed now that it, it, it's an option for a lot of people, and I think everyone growing up right now should definitely be considering doing I suppose it's one of the things that basketball offers that potentially other sports don't necessarily do. I mean, you think of football being the obvious one where education almost gets in the way of your, your, your training for football. Uh, basketball gives you that opportunity either domestically through tie-ups with BBL clubs and their local university or the opportunity to go to America and through their collegiate system as well. It, it really gives you a chance to come out the other end with something more than just either a playing career or not quite having made it. You, you can still go through the education system and get a job and be a useful person in society, even if you don't make it as a, as a player. Yeah, I think it comes down to value. Um, like, you know, you play in the premiership, value a lot of the time is money. You're going to make mm. millions and millions of pounds um, playing over, you know, five, six, seven years. So I think the value of, playing professional basketball in England, um, there's an added value to the fact that you can walk away with a degree um, and that they they want you to. I think a lot of the BBL teams that have university setups now, they're, they're inviting people to, to get a degree whilst playing for them. Um, and I think that both sides win. University gets a great athlete and you walk away with a degree. So 
yeah, I think it's huge. And a lot of kids think uh, immediately about going through the NCAA route, which is great if you get to Duke or UNC or that, that sort of level. Um, did that ever, was that ever a consideration for you? Did you ever think about that path? Do you feel like you missed out on something? Um, yeah, there's, there's probably part to the story that, you know, you don't need to be in this interview, so to speak, but <laughs> there was an opportunity for me to go to a university in America, um, Stony Brook University. They offered me a scholarship. It was on the table. I was doing all the paperwork that I needed to do to make that happen. Um, unfortunately, there was somebody on this side of the field who didn't do their due diligence when I was playing um, in Essex. So I say due diligence. They didn't do the paperwork that they were supposed to do for me to be able to go. So thankfully, Leicester Riders um, offered me an opportunity uh, where I could play for them. And, you know, if we sorted out the American situation, I could still go. Um, but once I was there for, you know, about a month or so, I kind of just let the Stony Brook University thing go. I was really happy with the situation that I had, um, Loughborough University, playing at the Riders. It was it was a great feel for me. I think it was a great fit for me. Um, and I kind of just let the whole American dream thing kind of go. I don't think I regret it. I know that going to play for Stony Brook University would have been an amazing experience or could have been an amazing experience. Um, not to mention all the other schools in America, but I'm very happy with um, the journey that I've had so far, and I definitely don't have any regrets. I suppose it's one of those path things, isn't it? You can take one fork, and then you wonder what the other fork might have led to, but you never quite know how you might have reacted going down that first path in the in, in the first place. Um, so I want to get into a little bit about um, playing Bucks and BBL at the same time. Um, obviously that's a lot of training, extra games and all of that. How did you balance a, the demands of all of that uh, and, and actually harness it to become a better player? Um, I think I use books as an opportunity to mature, actually. Um, I tried to be a role model when I was at the university level. Um, you know, you go from being on a professional team of guys who are all being paid some of the guys aren't from this country, you know, it's, it's, it's a business. And then you go to books and you've got a lot of people that want to become a professional player. They want to get to that level. So I think I tried to be the role model in that situation and kind of show them what it took to get to that level or how you're supposed to act at that level. Um, so I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that role quite a lot, actually. Um, I think it was good for my maturity um, and my uh, evolution as a player. And talking about roles, you've, you've just turned 30 now. I suppose that pushes you into the veteran category, does it? Have, have you noticed as you've got older the role that you're playing in the team environment changing? Um, yeah, I think my word carries a little bit more weight now. Um, you know, I've always tried to lead by example, but there's been moments this year where I felt the urge to speak. You know, five, six years ago, I just nodded my head. If we was in a huddle, I didn't say anything. I just nodded my head. Whereas now I felt the urge to say, well, okay, this needs to be said. Or, you know, let me add to what the captain has just said. Um, and I think it's just because I kind of can relate to the veteran mindset, but I can also relate to the younger mindset as well. Um, so... I'm kind of, I feel like I'm that bridge between. Um, so uh, looking back, obviously uh, the season cut short uh, by the pandemic, but the, before that, your numbers, your efficiency, some of the best uh, in your career, do you feel like you've still got room for growth and improvement? Oh, definitely. 100%. Um, my journey is far from over. I just think it's all about mindset for me. So... <clears throat> For a long time, I've, I've had the mindset of get better, you know, become a better shooter, become a better dribbler, better passer. Like, that's been my mindset for so many years. And I would say over the last year, maybe two years, is the first time where I've actually said, okay, you've put a lot of work in. You've put a lot of extra hours in. Now it's time to reap the reward. Um, go out there and perform at the level that you 
to be performing at. So there's been a shift of focus. Um, I'm now more interested in my performance rather than just, you know, how do I get better? How do I get better? So when basketball stopped, um, you're obviously the last game I think was against Manchester in, in, in early March. Uh, as somebody who is in the gym every day, how did that affect your, your mindset? Suddenly the gyms are closed, you're locked down, can't go anywhere. As an athlete, that must have been quite a, a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for everybody, but as an athlete, it must have been a particular challenge for you. Yeah. As I spoke earlier about when I was at the Nottingham Youth Basketball Club, I had a lot of leaders around me, a lot of people who I could go to for advice and help. And fortunately, at 30 years old, I still have these people in my life um, with the addition of new people. Um, but one of them is my dad, huge um, in terms of getting advice from. And he does karate. Uh, he actually does kung fu, like fourth dan. You know, he's at a level where he can teach it around the world. And he always said to me from a young age, you've got to be like water. You've got to be able to react to whatever is happening. You've got to be able to move around it, move through it, move over it, whatever it needs to be. So with that mindset, I'm trying to react to this whole situation, but not let it knock me off my path. Um, so, you know, whether that's I'm reading more, uh, more books, you know, I'm trying to challenge my intelligence. I'm trying to improve myself as a person, um, whatever it is, I try to keep that same energy that I was putting into basketball into my life. So yeah, I'm just trying to improve in all over areas until I can get back on the court. And from a, from a physical point of view, obviously you need to keep yourself in, 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 in top condition. Did you divert into other things, running or cycling, or, or how did you get through? What was your one exercise a day when we were permitted one exercise a day? Yoga, actually. Um, it really helped with my mindset. Um, it was a kind of thing where I wake up and yoga is difficult, man. Like, I don't know how much yoga you've, you've done, <laughs> but man, like, it doesn't matter what kind of shape you're in, it's difficult. So for me, the challenge of yoga every day kind of set my day off right because I felt like I'd already won before the day had started because I had got my, I had gone through that session and there were moments in that session where I wanted to quit. I didn't. So I knew that if I did that every morning, I did it through Instagram actually, um, Laura Jones Yoga. Um, I did that every morning and it, it just set the day off right and I felt like I could you know, take on the world at that point. So you've done yoga, you've done more reading and stuff. I, I suppose the interesting thing about lockdown is how people react to being unlocked. And do you think it's changed you in any way? Do you, have you become more reflective about it? I, th I think we'll see from society people coming out the other side and going, actually, what I used to do, I want to do it differently or I want to take some of the things that I've learned. Has it changed you in any way? Um, I think it's taught me that I can give more than I realized I could give. So I've started working alongside a company called Locate Me. And they're a student lettings company. And I've been learning so much about the company. Um, and, you know, I have plans for the future where, you know, maybe I can open my own franchise one day. Um, and it's made me realize that I can give more, you know, like, yes, I'm a professional athlete. Yes, that is the, the priority in my life right now is my career, it's my job. But I actually have more to give. Um, there's more in the tank. Uh, so I guess I've just expanded who I am. Uh, and that's, that's been really nice to, to understand that I, I have that. And at some point soon, you'll be able to get back to, uh, to playing, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and I, I suppose that's been a massive hole in your life that you'll be desperate to get back to and, and, and take up again. Yeah, I'm hungry. I really am. I am very hungry to get back in the basketball court. Um, we had a taste of it a couple of weeks ago where we was allowed elite bubbles uh, at the Leicester Arena. But obviously, unfortunately, Leicester's gone back into the lockdown, so that's been shut down. Um, but me and Jordan Godfrey, the Leicester Riders uh, strength and conditioning coach, we've been on the rugby pitch in Loughborough pretty much every day, just doing cardio, running, everything you can imagine. 
um, just to make sure that when that day comes, I'm ready. So you've talked a little bit about the uh, role models in your life. Do you now see that as an important part of what you do as an athlete, being a role model for the younger children you see, whether they're, you know, the fans that come to the games, the young kids who go through the development system at Leicester or, or wherever, or in Nottingham as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, not only me, actually, former players I've spoken to, um, I was just having a conversation with Levi Knoll, um, who was a former Riders player, and I know that there are some uh, scrimmages or some indoor basketball that I've seen on Instagram in London recently. So I asked him, I said, have you been going to them? Expecting it, yes. You know, I'm sure he's as desperate to get back on the court as I am. And he said, no. And I, I said, why not? Why have you not been going? He said, because I have... I'm a leader. Like there's kids that look up to me. There's kids that ask me how to get better. And he said, it's a conflict of interest for him to go and break, you know, lockdown rules to play basketball. And these kids are looking up to, looking up to him. Um, and that was a big moment for me where I was like, that's, that's, that's huge. Um, we are being watched all the time. You know, whether we know the people that are watching us or not, the younger kids that are growing up, they have Instagram, they have YouTube, they have all the, footage that they can find and they're building a perception of us as athletes and as people so i would say especially during this time my actions are huge um and i'm trying to I'm trying my best to lead with good action i want to get a little bit into the um into the times that we find ourselves in the rise of the black lives matter movement over recent weeks since the murder of of george, george floyd um, how important do you think it is for sportsmen to stand up and be counted in a situation like this? Because we've, George Floyd is not the first person to be killed in the manner that he was killed, but it, he's probably the one that has sparked more international uh, response to it. Where do you see sports voice in keeping that narrative going and actually turning what are laudable thoughts into actual real action? Um. Yeah, so I think athletes uh, are more than just an athlete, you know. Um, it comes back to that word again, leaders. We're leaders of our communities, where we're from. I'm from Nottingham, so I see myself as someone who's flying the flag for Nottingham. And I think that as an athlete, being on the front of papers and, you know, advertisements for Nike and whatever else it is, you are in the limelight. So you have an opportunity to make a difference, to spread a message. Um, and I think a lot of athletes have taken that opportunity. And I think a lot of athletes haven't uh, for, for their own personal uh, reasons. But I do feel like, you know, if you feel strong enough about whatever the issue is, that you should stand up for it and you should speak out on it when you can um, and not shy away from making a change. Um, you know, whether you believe that you saying something that's going to make a massive change or not. Um, again, it comes back to people are watching all of us. People are watching every athlete in every sport. So I think speaking out on oppression, uh, racism, injustice is huge, especially for the people that are fighting for it every day. And um, we've seen a reaction to this that um, in my lifetime, I can't remember any, any equivalents to where, you see it at Premier League football with the names on the back of the shirts, the taking the knee before the game. Uh, it, it's something that we've, we've not really seen before, but it's going to be the challenge for sports, uh, particularly as the, as the visuals, to help turn that into actual real tangible difference and action for people on the ground. Yeah, I think it, it kind of comes down to agents, um, club owners, uh, the staff of the clubs, marketing teams, all of those people to come together and have a plan of action. You know, it's, it's easy to point at these athletes and say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually important for the, for the organizations to bring some sort of plan of action that these athletes can then follow up with. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be, that'd be great. I mean, you see the community work that, that Leicester does and indeed all the, all the clubs in, in the league. 
and actually with basketball being such a diverse sport, it feels like a really good vehicle uh, for something like that into, into, into local communities and actually supporting in a way that perhaps other sports uh, are unable to do. Yeah, basketball, for anyone that knows basketball in, in England, it's front line. Like, you know, when you finish a game, you are face to face with everyone, the opposite team's fans and your own fans. So the effect that we can have on the community is, is massive because we're in the community. We're not just doing an appearance every now and then. You know, you have three or four, sometimes five sessions a week where you're going into a school and speaking to children. You're teaching them the importance of not smoking. You're teaching the importance of nutrition um, through the Hoops for Health programs that we have around the country. So, yeah, I, I do think that basketball players in England can have a massive effect on the next generation. I suppose I go back to, to sort of year eight, uh, Jamel, what, what your, how, those imp, how those around like Curtis would have um, impacted on you, you can now have that same impact on, on the current year eights or even younger than that. Yeah, I'm not taking anything away from Curtis here as well, but I think parenting, for me anyway, is the biggest thing in all of this. Um, you know, I, seeing the George, George Floyd situation hit home a lot of emotions for me that maybe I was pushing down or almost ignoring um, just so I could get through day to day without feeling depressed or, you know, really down about the situations that are going on around the world. But I think parenting is probably the biggest thing that I think could change the world for the better. Um, my parents from day one have always taught me how racism is terrible. Always taught me, you know, just because you're being, people are being racist to you, that doesn't give you the right to react with racism or to lay your hands on someone. Um, and everything that I stand for, all my morals came from them. Obviously, I was guided a lot by X, the basketball as a sport, but it started with my parents. Um, and I, I would love for the world to kind of react in a way that's like, okay, with all of this oppression, all of this racism, all of the terrible things that are going on in the world, my children, um, I'm going to teach them the right way so that when they grow up, they know the difference between right and wrong, rather than allowing this pattern to just continue. And therein is the, is the challenge as well. I suppose some of it comes into education as well and through the, through the school system. Um, I suppose one of the challenges uh, for basketball historically, and, and you kind of touched it on uh, inadvertently in the fact that you had to go two bus routes to get to the basketball that was available, is the lack of facilities in this country to give children the opportunity to play. And you will have seen at Morningside Arena, the numbers of children who go through there every day, and old guys like me, to be fair, but the, 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 the numbers of children who go through there every day, who up until that building coming to fruition a few years ago, would have not had that opportunity to play in, and the importance of giving children that opportunity. Yeah, I think, to be honest with you, since I was year eight, Jamel, the amount of basketball courts there are now is tenfold. You know, like, there is a lot of opportunity to get on a basketball court. Is there enough opportunity to get on a basketball court at the level of Leicester Riders Arena? No. Um, mm. You can get on a court, but the hoop might not be the right height. The floor mm. might have holes in it. Um, you've got to compete with badminton and hockey and whatever other line there is on the floor. <laughs> um, so, yes, there's more facilities, but funnily enough, there's still not enough opportunity for basketball players of all ages um, to play uh, without having to spend, you know, a ridiculous amount of money to get on those courts. So I definitely think we've still got a long way to go. Um, and I do believe that one major difference is in America, a lot of these courts that these people are using are tied to an organization. They're tied to a school or a university or a college or a high school. Um, so I do believe that the educational system here 
um, could have a pivotal change in, in, in providing more basketball uh, opportunities. And I suppose uh, that therein is the challenge, is to how we can make them basketball specific rather than, you know, the, the, the London tube map of lines that you yeah. see in, in, in most. And obviously you're, you're marrying into, into basketball royalty now. So your father-in-law, Jeff, is one of these guys banging the drums for, for extra facilities and the work that oh. he's, he, he's, he's done up in Manchester. And I, I guess that's the challenge for, for, for basketball is opening that up for, in a way that allows them to not be competing with badminton, for example, which is always the swear word in basketball terms. And, and how as a sport, it, they manage to get the funding to allow, you know, the performance center in Manchester or the Morningside Arena or the Eagles Community Arena in more places than, than currently exist. Yeah, again, like, I feel like the educational system can have such a huge change. Um, they have the kind of money to, to build these types of uh, facilities and it's going to work alongside their own goals and their own plans. Um, obviously, having books, university teams, um, being able to use those facilities, but then also in the evenings or, you know, when people aren't at college, community in that area can use that uh, facility so I, I think that would be the biggest change and i think you know like you said my soon to be father-in-law is is banging the drums for this um i don't think we need a huge pot of money for this to happen i just think the pots of money that are around the country need to put their little bit in to their community to their arena and obviously uh, your your fiance is a uh, is a international basketball player as well and and i think sometimes uh women's basketball gets a a bit of a rough deal when when looking at how women's sport has grown in recent years um but but women's basketball we see the challenges now for teams to come back sheffield one of the great historical names in 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 women's basketball struggling financially may not be able to come back but it's a it's a challenge to to uh to the sport and indeed those above the sport in governments to ensure that we have the availability for women and girls as well as the boys uh, to, to be able to play. Yeah, I mean, like it goes back to when I was a kid. Like, you know, I had a hoop in my back garden, but I didn't know about the opportunities. And I still believe now, even though we have social media, you know, like I said, YouTube, all those kind of things, there are kids growing up in England who like basketball, they may have seen some sort of program or whatever, but they don't, no one's making the connection in their mind that actually, if you start right now, you can then progress into, you know, playing at college and school and professionally, that no one's putting those two and two together. Um, so I think we're missing out on huge amounts of kids that could have started at a younger age, just because those opportunities aren't in, in their face the same way football rugby is I guess I'm not expecting that you necessarily know the, the, the challenge for society is how we how we flip that how do we open up opportunity uh, for young children in whatever community they happen to live in in, in this country to, to be able to see that that pathway that that option for them um, my opinion on this is probably quite controversial um, all the conversations I've had with, you know, Georgia, for example, my fiance, family, friends, you know, teammates, no one else has ever said it the way I've said it. So I feel like the amount of times I've said it now, I'm like, oh, maybe this is a bit controversial. But for me, as a kid growing up in England right now, when I go to a basketball game, I see the riders, I'm like, wow, you know, it's amazing, cool arena. This is great. When you go to a premiership football game, you know full well before you've even stepped in the, in the, in the do you want to call it arena? Stadium. Call it? Stadium. Stadium. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, I only know about you. Um, when you step into the stadium, it's, it's just more glamorous. Like, you know, you know that those guys are pulling up in Ferraris and they have mansions and everything about it is just like, wow. 
And I think that at a young age, that's very influential to a lot of kids. That is, that makes you want to play football, that, that influences you down in that path. Whereas basketball, there's just a lot of unknown. They, they don't know what type of money basketball players make. They don't know what type of lifestyle basketball players live. They don't see any of it. They just see what they see on the court and then they go home. You know, we're not on TV. We're not on Big Brother or, you know, we're not in the papers all the time. So they just don't see that lifestyle. So in their mind, like for me, when I was a kid, they're not connecting the two that actually I can do this and this is what it will look like. and This is what I could become so that we're not creating dreams for them. And I, in my opinion, that's what needs to change. I suppose some of that as well is about messaging from within the, within the sport itself. So I think back to that Essex team that you played on right at the beginning. There's only, I think, two or three of you still playing uh, at a professional level from that uh, uh, original team. Um, and Miles Hessen being one of them, doing tremendous things in France uh, and presumably on very good money as well. And yet consciously, the the rest of the country probably doesn't even see that. Exactly. So Miles Hessen, in my opinion, gone. He's made. He's, he's playing at a high level in, in Europe, making you know great money, but he's not put in the spotlight the same way as a football player who's mm -hmm. playing at a high level, as the same level as Miles, but in football is. Um, you know, he's just. We're just not talked about. Mm. I guess. Uh, I guess that was some of the challenge with uh, Luol Deng, who was almost criminally under-reported uh, in this country, exactly. given the exploits that he did at, 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 the, NBA, at the NBA level. And I, I think some of that is about potentially the sport as well, and, and some of it is about um, our consciousness. I don't know if we've got enough bandwidth for all the sports maybe in this country, and, and that's the challenge. We see this uh, intruder sport from America and don't necessarily, don't really understand the globalness about it. So the fact that, you know, Dan Clark's playing in, in ACB or, or, or Miles is playing in France and Germany and the places that he's played. And, and people almost, and even guys who've been over to Japan or wherever, we kind of, you played in Australia, of course, we kind of don't even think about all of those countries having basketball exposure. And I guess that's a challenge for the sport as much as it is for those who cover sport. Yeah, I I don't have an answer for how necessarily that could be done. Um, but I do believe, for example, you know, in my first couple of years playing professionally, I was still catching a bus, you know, like <laughs> I'm getting on a bus to the game and there might be fans that are on the bus. Mm -hmm. So as a young kid, when you're sat next to the person who you're paying to go watch on the bus, it just doesn't add up. You know, you're never mm -hmm. going to be sat next to David Beckham on the way to a football game. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be sat next to Messi on a train on the way to a game. So I just feel like the, the wires are getting a little bit crossed in terms of creating dreams in these kids' minds because the difference between basketball and football is just so huge. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's kind of the challenge for most other sports beyond football, maybe uh, uh, not rugby, but e e even at a lesser extent, cricket, has its uh, highs and lows, if you like, in terms of uh, the size of the club and the, and the things that they're doing. Um, we're almost there now. Uh, if you reflect now back and go back to that year, HML, that played out on this basketball journey, would you have any advice for him along the way? Um, I'd probably take more, uh, the word, uh, take more chances. I take more chances. I was very, uh, like straight line. I didn't want to try that. I didn't want to go play there. I didn't want to go to that tournament or, you know, I just tried to, tried to stay on one course the whole way. And I think maybe I missed out on a few opportunities. Um, but other than that, just to enjoy it enjoy the highs and lows it wasn't until probably after my heart surgeries that i really understood to appreciate everything appreciate every time i step on the floor appreciate every time i get to play basketball 
Um, and I, from that point, I have. I really do. I enjoy everything. Even when we're losing, I, I take it as an experience that I can learn from. And I, I guess uh, one of the things that you have the opportunity now, having been a professional basketball player for 10 years and hopefully another 10 in you sort of thing, is the opportunity to inspire that next young child in Nottingham who wants to come up and, and actually being visible and them seeing, well, actually a little kid from Clifton can make it to, to where you've made it and maybe even, even beyond that. Yeah, well, thankfully, I, I do believe that a lot of kids are, especially in Nottingham, thanks to the work of Nottingham Hood and Nottingham Wildcats, they're, they're being given um, environments, teams, and uh, opportunities to play basketball. So that's amazing uh, from a very young age too. Um, but I think my, I, the responsibility I believe I have in myself is when any of these people reach out to me, is that I give them the full picture. So I explain to them, you know, I've been to Australia three times. I've, I've played at the Commonwealth Games. I traveled all around the world because if I don't tell them, how else are they gonna know? Um, you know, like I said, we're not on TV. We're not in the papers enough. You know, our stories aren't told. So I take that responsibility to make sure that I express the whole journey as much as I can in that conversation. And if we park the, 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 the moments after the game in the, in the Commonwealth Games, which is obviously going to be your highlight, uh, proposing uh, to Georgia like that, what, what, what have been the, the big moments of your career to date that you look back on and go, wow, that was, that was something special. My first ever GB jersey, you know, something that I never at the time thought was going to happen. Um, I actually was rooming with Miles Hessen and we were both stayed up late talking about, you know, how amazing it would be if we both got selected for the team. You know, we were practically nobodies at that point. So that was an experience that I shared with him. Um, and it was, it was incredible. Winning um, my first BBL trophy uh, was, you know, an incredible achievement. We, we were considered probably underdogs that season. So to win a treble as well was, man, like, <laughs> you, you can't put words to an experience like that. Um, and then winning in Australia as well. Uh, again, underdog mentality. No one was talking about us. And to win in the way we did in the third game of a three-game series was just it brought tears to my eyes, so something I'll never forget. And and just finally, the the goals for the year, the years ahead. The, the I don't know how long you plan on 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 playing, but you, you look like you've got many years still. Still things to achieve for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, my goals, you know, they change all the time. They they evolve with whatever's going on. Um, so you know, my goal for next season is to give everything I got, you know, we don't, we don't know how long basketball can be played for. They might shut it down if there's, you know, another issue with the epidemic. Um, so, you know, just to give everything I've got whilst I'm on the floor. Well, it's been fascinating to uh, talk to you over the last uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever it's been so far. Uh, thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me.